Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our program today on the risk of corrosive capital from China to the Americas. My name is Eric Farnsworth. I'm the Vice President and Head of the Washington Office of the Council of the Americas from where I'm coming to you today. And it's my distinct pleasure as well to uh, work today's program also with our partner, the Center for International Private Enterprise, and we'll ask them to give a brief welcome message very soon. The definition of corrosive capital is one that uh, a number of people have been discussing over the recent months, but uh, here's one definition that uh, I'd like you to all think about. Corrosive capital is project finance, whether from state or private sources, that lacks transparency and accountability and potentially undermines democratic institutional institutionality. Let me say that again potentially undermines democratic institutionality. That's what we're talking about today in our program. We believe the meeting today is very timely as Latin America and the Caribbean began to emerge out of the COVID pandemic. Growth is returning to the region, but not fast enough, not widely enough, and not equitably enough. The region needs resources. The region needs debt relief. The region needs uh, investment capital for growth and development. Where's that capital going to come from? Well, that's a good question, uh, but it's not just money, it's what kind of money and what are the implications of the money that does come into the region that the region clearly needs. The Biden administration is also aware of these issues and seized with the, uh, the needs of the region. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, was just in Colombia and Ecuador talking about some of these issues as well as senior delegation of the Development Finance Corporation, as well as White House officials were also in Ecuador and Colombia and Panama talking specifically about development capital as part of the Biden administration's Build Back Better World initiative. This has been variously described as a way to counter China's Belt and Road Initiative and other uh, descriptors as well. There is a battle going on right now for the hearts and minds of the people of the Western Hemisphere with open questions in terms of how uh, these issues will play out coming out of the COVID pandemic. We've got a great panel today that we wanna hear from. They have terrific insights, and we're gonna to get to that in just a minute. But before we do, I wanna ask John Zemko of the Center for International Private Enterprise, uh, who is the regional director for Latin America and the Caribbean there, to come on and to give his uh, uh, welcome and introduction for the program today. And after John says uh, his comments, I will introduce the panelists and we'll get the program going. John Zamko, over to you, please. Great, thanks so much, Eric. It's such a pleasure to be uh, partnering with you on this, um, on this initiative. Um, SIPE has been looking at this initiative, at this uh, topic over the last couple of years um, as a global initiative, um, because we saw how important it was to take a look at, at the, just the sheer quantity of money that was floating in the world economy that was moving from um, authoritarian regimes to democratic regimes with very little understood about exactly what kind of impact it was having. So we have been, as an organization, have been looking at it in the region, in a number of uh, Latin American countries, you know, working with partners to get an understanding of exactly what corrosive capital was and how it sort of manifested itself. So I'm really excited today to um, hear from our panelists, um, to hear their perspectives on this topic, and um, hopefully to explore this in, in, in future events that uh, we'll be partnering with, with the council. So without further ado, I wanna, I'm eager to hear our panelists. So um, I'm gonna turn it right back to Eric. Thanks again. John, thank you. And let me also reiterate on behalf of the council, our real pleasure to be partnering with you on this uh, program today and also for a series of activities that will be coming up in the coming months uh, to explore these issues further and in greater depth. Well, as promised, ladies and gentlemen, we have a terrific panel uh, for you today, and we want to get to that. So let me do brief introductions of each of them, and then we'll start the conversation. Our first panelist is Jessica Ludwig. Jessica really needs no introduction, but let me give her one anyway, because uh, she does deserve one. Uh, she's a senior program officer at the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy. She coordinates comparative research and analytical initiatives related to authoritarian sharp power projection. 
She's also coordinating the editor of the forum's Power 3.0 blog, or 3.0 blog, and producer of the Power 3.0 podcast, which explores how uh, resurgent authoritarian regimes worldwide leverage the features of globalization to exert influence beyond their borders and how democracies contend with these challenges. Jessica, it's great to have you back with the Council of the Americas today. Our next panelist, our second panelist, is David Shedd. Uh, again, somebody who uh, really needs no introduction. David is the former acting director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, he's also a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation. David worked uh, in the United States government for nearly 33 years uh, in posts throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. He served in various intelligence policy positions, examining a multitude of issues across the region. And he's going to provide some of the insights that he's brought uh, from those days, as well as uh, current uh, issues related to the financial sector uh, to our program today. David is also, like the other panelists, a personal friend. David, it's a real pleasure to have you uh, back with us here at the Council of the Americas. And then our third panelist is Parsifal de Sola. Parsifal is the, uh, excuse me, the founder and executive director of the Andres Bello Foundation. He's coming to us from Bogota, Colombia, uh, and he focuses on China and Latin America uh, research and activities, and he's a former policy analyst who specializes in China Latin American relations. He's done a lot of work in that space related to Venezuela, uh, as you might imagine, somebody who's based in Colombia. So we're going to start the program today uh, with Jessica. Jessica, I teased it out a little bit uh, based on your work with uh, um, National Endowment on Sharp Power. And if you could frame the issues for us today, what exactly is Sharp Power? And then we're going to go from there into how does corrosive capital fit into this whole concept? And then uh, we'll break it down from there. So, Jessica, to you, please, for uh, some comments about Sharp Power in the Americas. Thank you, Eric and John, for organizing this conversation today. Uh, before I get into the um, sharp power and corrosive capital. I actually want to start with um, backing up just a little bit uh, to how Latin America often views the relationship with China um, before I segue into sharp power. So there's a stubbornly held belief uh, among Latin America's political economic elite, as well as many other public audiences, that China's principal interests in Latin America are primarily economic. In a conversation that I participated in to not too long ago, um, a former, a prominent former politician from the region said, and I quote, it is economic suicide to speak critically about China's government, underscoring that the region's need for economic growth and the perceived benefits from trade, investment, and financing from the PRC seem to outweigh all other concerns um, in, in terms of how that relationship develops with the Chinese government. And this was a comment from somebody who I have a lot of respect for, um, so they shall remain nameless, of course, but I thought it was indicative of, uh, sadly, almost a best case scenario view and perspective that is held among Latin America's decision makers, uh, that when engaging with China, certain topics are off limits. And so you have to ask, where does this fear come from? Where does this innate concern come from? On the other side of the spectrum, of course, there are many uh, in the media sector, many in the think tank sector, academics, uh, other very influential voices around the region, of course, in the business community as well, who have not at all, seem to have not at all interrogated the nature of the relationship with China or even in specific cases, uh, the terms under which certain economic agreements, investment and financing agreements uh, for specific projects have taken place, whether they are necessary at all, whether projects will bring economic benefits, uh, whether they will pay for themselves in the long term. So this brings me, of course, this, uh, you know, there's an environment in Latin America in which uh, there's perhaps not really enough information known. There's not enough independent analysis um, because on both sides of the spectrum, you know, there, there are those who have um, been taken up by what in the past we have often understood as 
perhaps or misunderstood as a charm offensive uh, by China's government towards Latin America. And then on the other side, those who tacitly understand that, uh, you know, if, if you criticize the Chinese government, there might be or are likely to be very strong repercussions for your country. Um, so this brings me now to the topic of sharp power. How did we get here and what does sharp power mean? Um, and so zooming out a little bit from viewing the relationship solely through an economic lens, we need to see the bigger picture. Um, and because China's motiva political motivations that are motivating Beijing in particular uh, and driving its policy towards Latin America are not taking place in a vacuum. We, it's very important to understand that the authorities in China and what their motivations are for engaging not just with Latin America, but also for the rest of the world and how they want to position China on the world stage. And fundamentally, the, the point that's often not discussed, uh, again, because of uh, lack of information coming out of China and this fear and censorship, uh, is that China's authorities are, uh, China is ruled by a one party state and its authorities have in recent years in particular uh, been deepening their repression within China. Um, ultimately, what we need to keep in mind is that China's authorities are not just motivated by economic gains. Of course, it's in their interest to deliver economic gains for the Chinese people, um, but this is because their legitimacy derives precisely from that economic development that they're able to provide because it is not an elected government. And the Chinese Communist Party is fundamentally most interested in making sure that the world is safe for the Chinese Communist Party to be in charge in China. So this is the point I would underscore that always needs to be kept in perspective um, when, think, when then returning back to what is shaping the economic relationship and the information environment. Um, elsewhere around the world. And, and so zooming back in uh, to Latin America and um, into this idea of sharp power. Um, sharp power is a, a concept that at the endowment we have developed to help uh, reframe the way that we're understanding author how authoritarian governments are engaging with other parts of the world. And China in particular is at the forefront of, of many of these efforts as a very well-resourced uh, and one of the, the largest authoritarian uh, governments in the world. And what happens when, um, it, in the way that Beijing seeks to engage with other parts of the world uh, is that you know, we can't expect uh, an, an authoritarian government that has developed certain mechanisms of repression uh, and essentially control, uh, the desire to control, um, those characteristics do come out in the way that they engage with other parts of the world. And so what we see is not soft power necessarily, but sharp power. It, and that reflects an authoritarian determination to monopolize ideas, suppress alternative narratives and exploit partner institutions. And this is happening increasingly beyond China's borders. Um, sharp power takes advantage uh, of the vulnerabilities of open societies and can corrode the integrity of public institutions by impairing free expression, neutralizing uh, independent organizations and voices. And ultimately the impact is that it can distort the political environment. Um, so, you know, I think that the first, again, point I would underscore is that we need to understand this pervasive censorship around how we talk about China, how we get information about what's happening inside of China before we assume what we know about China and whether or not it's true because China is a very large, diverse, important country. Um, and there's simply a greater need for independent analysis about it. Yeah, no, thanks very much and uh, for, for uh, opening the door for that broader discussion. And let's go to David uh, Shed now for some specific thoughts within the framework that Jessica has just laid out. David, the US Secretary of State in Ecuador just last week uh, said that the United States was not going to ask Latin American and Caribbean to choose between the United States and China. 
which I think is probably true. Uh, but the question I would ask you as both a practitioner as well as a keen observer of the region uh, is, is that a meaningful distinction? Uh, is there, uh, has the region already chosen? And what does it mean, according to what Jessica is saying, for elites who believe they have no ability to uh, not say yes to China? What does that mean in the context of Chinese money coming into the region? Uh, what are your thoughts about some of those issues? Well, thank you, Eric, and thank you, John, for, for hosting this uh, really important event. And I just want to associate myself with uh, Jessica's opening comments on, on this sharp power. As I, as I look at the region writ large and China's interest in it, I think we first have to dispel for those who still have this idea that it's really largely driven by uh, a, uh, a, an ideological drive as opposed to very pragmatic objectives by both the uh, PRC the, the, and, and the government alongside of the uh, Chinese Communist Party, a party of about 80 million out of 1.3 billion people in which their objectives are really being um, shaped around access to infrastructure, access to information, access in a two-way uh, relationship in terms of commerce and access that they then pro provide through financing uh, that is not uh, in the traditional sense of, of uh, value-driven as the American uh, investment might be. Uh, the, a, a very distant objective on their part if even existent at all, is the Foreign Corruption Act or anything related to how they shape uh, that investment. And so you, you look at, in a 15-year period, about $137 billion in loans uh, into the, in, from major Chinese banks into the region throughout, the, uh, throughout Latin America. That includes Central America and obviously South America, with really three major objectives in mind. The first is the access to raw materials in the, in the relationship and in, in that um, exploitation of raw materials, they are also getting access to domestic markets. The second thing is that they each want to expand a credit relationship with, with the countries where these investments are made and they are attracted, this being the Chinese are attracted to governments that at least if they're not explicitly involved in corruption, they certainly are uh, uh, willing to look the other way in terms of that. Uh, a very interesting area, and this goes back to my own background in, in intelligence and, and uh, security, is that a lot of their investments are also, and this, this has a unique attraction in turning not only uh, uh, smart cities into smart cities, but safe cities. And what they're doing in selling their technology and selling their, uh, their, their uh, ideology behind that technology, which is authoritarianism, is to bring uh, the, the cameras and the data flows around creating an environment that uh, collects uh, volumes of information not seen before. Or that information goes back to China as well as locally and makes the authoritarianism of control of local populations very, very attractive from a security standpoint. And so it's not only the investment in infrastructure such as ports, electric grids, space-based, uh, in, particularly in the Southern Cone in Argentina, but it's, it's this larger expansive investment in what they would call enabling the security inside these, uh, in, inside these countries. And, and that should be very worrisome now to uh, the, the quote that you gave coming out of, I presume out of Quito uh, in terms of, 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 of what was said by uh, Tony Blinken, Secretary Blinken. And it does matter. Uh, it may not be a distinction in terms of on the ground, and, and I will be very interested in hearing what Parsifal is seeing as a, as a practitioner uh, in Colombia and, and in the region. But, but in the end, it comes without the strings attached to issues such human rights, 
It's financing that has no association with the area of uh, uh, anti-corruption. It has no association with environmental uh, restraints or controls associated with it. And what's very interesting, and I'll end my opening comments with, this is all accompanied with a propaganda machine that goes with it. Xinhua is, is one of the fastest growing media expansive presence uh, in Latin America. This is along with the Confucius Institutes, uh, of which I believe there's about 25 throughout the region, is, is, a, is something that is propelling the information and disinformation associated, as, as Jessica pointed out, not only to neutralize the, the, the other side of the, of the campaigns associated with truth telling, but, but to promote the, the, the message from the CCP throughout the region. So it's really a holistic approach to the region that ought to concern us profoundly and not limited to just the, the financial aspects, which I'm most familiar with in my afterlife of the, of the work that I do. I think you both pointed to a very important um, issue, a very important reality, and that is that, yes, China's engaged on an economic and financial basis, but the implications are much broader than that. And it's interesting. I mean, you talk to analysts in Washington or elsewhere, and, and they're oftentimes very dismissive about that there's any bigger implication here. It's all economics and trade, and you know the U.S. can't compete in the region anyway, so what are we so concerned about? The Financial Times just quoted the analyst saying, almost exactly that. Uh, and so the question then is, well, do they have it right? And it sounds like what we're hearing uh, from both of you is uh, that indeed there is a much bigger story here that we need to be aware of. And I appreciate bringing uh, those concepts into our conversation. Uh, we're gonna go to Parsifal right now uh, for an on the ground um, uh, vision in terms of what you see happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, China is funding a lot of projects, the subway in Bogota and various other things. Um, you know, people in Bogota need a subway and need better transportation. Anybody who's ever taken a ride on the streets of Bogota knows that uh, we need better transportation uh, solutions, as we do in Washington as well. But the point there, the question I'm asking is, how are you viewing these issues on the ground? Do you see things similarly as uh, perhaps what we do in D.C.? Or is there a point here that we're, that we're missing? Parsifal to Solo, please. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, John, for, for the invitation, for organizing this event. Um, well, getting right into it, uh, building on what Jessica and David said, uh, I, I think uh, what we're missing here is the Latin American perspective. And it's, it's, uh, it builds on what Jessica mentioned at the beginning uh, about you know, how the region views China and how the region views what China is doing at a broader level uh, throughout the region. Yes, there's a lot of focus in terms of financing. Yes, there's a lot of focus on, on, on infrastructure projects. But uh, I think there has been an important shift over the past four or five years and that uh, which the pandemic served to uh, just simply uh, push the, the, the gas pedal to, to um, to, to an extreme. Um, in the last couple of years, we have seen, in the context of the pandemic, not only you know the so-called vaccine diplomacy, but it's a much broader emphasis on this context of South-South cooperation and how China, with the obvious subtext that it we are a part of you, we're not a part of them, be them the West, be them these countries that have exploited you, uh, which have, haven't have taken your interests into account. And this has been an important part of the narrative, not only at the government level, but also through private institutions. And when you see how Latin American governments and the public in general is perceiving this narrative, they, it, it does strike a tone. There's no... An, we, we all well know that there's no lack of uh, so-called anti-imperialists and uh, in, in the region and hard-leaning leftists that uh, um, build and, 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 and 
on what China has to say and, and they incorporate it into their own narratives at a political level to gain points at, a, at the local elections and, uh, and, and, and other sorts of policies. So um, I think China has molded their and adapted their nat narrative to the uh, needs of the region. And this, this is a very important uh, aspect. If, if you go back five, 10 years, it wasn't as sophisticated. It was a more, it was a more broader approach. And nowadays we see it not only at a regional level, but also at, uh, um, at a local, at a local level as well. We see it through their, uh, through their ambassadors, through their diplomatic corps. These are people that are the level of, of, uh, prof professionalization of their teams. It, it is very, on par to what you would see from you know traditional Western diplomatic corps, they speak the language, they're familiar with local politics, uh, and they know how to navigate internal uh, um, diplomatic conflicts. To 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 uh, put a name on it, so um, when you see how that narrative has permeated the region, as as David well mentioned, uh, there's a lot of Chinese official media that is now in Spanish. And the interesting thing is, is a lot of these stories permeate the local uh, media sphere. So uh, there's, um, when you see news about, as you mentioned, Derek, the Bogota uh, uh, subway in, in, uh, constructed by, by, by a Chinese infrastructure uh, company, most of the cited facts, the cited uh, uh, information about the project comes from Chinese official sources. So, and this well goes line in line with uh, what Jessica was mentioning that there's uh, there's uh, a vacuum in terms of independent coverage about what China is doing, how it's doing it. So, and it, this this builds into this helps what what uh, um, what China has been doing, and it, it serves as a uh, as a PR uh, for for these companies for the Chinese government. So yes, I think there has been uh, not uh, an, an increment, not only in terms of scale, but uh, also in terms of sophistication of the message and how uh, uh, the, the region is, is perceiving this. I think that's a really important point. Uh, we have to recognize that China's uh, entrance into the region is really only since uh, this century, which is only 20 years or so, uh, in any sort of significant way. Uh, and like anybody, uh, you know, there were some initial missteps, but uh, certainly it's a relationship that's growing and uh, people are learning from it and the approach is becoming more sophisticated. I think that's a really important insight uh, that you just brought to the table, Parsifal. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go to uh, back to Jessica. Jessica, we've talked around the issue. I want to zero in on the issue. I want to ask you why, I mean, look, China should have the ability to trade with Latin America, right? China should have the ability to invest in Latin America. Latin America needs infrastructure investment. Latin America needs markets for its primary products. Uh, I don't think anybody would deny that uh, in the context of either this conversation or, or more broadly. What makes, what, what is the concerning issue here about uh, capital investment from China? Uh, you know, why are we suggesting uh, that it's providing a corrosive influence on democracy? That's a pretty dramatic charge to make. Uh, and I think that that's something we want to explore more specifically. So Jessica, some thoughts on that. What is it about Chinese capital in the region that might concern us from a democracy perspective? Thanks, Eric, and I'm glad we can finally turn now to the question <laughs> of the conversation. Um, you know, the, I, I love the concept of corrosive capital that SITE has developed because it um, really does, I think, help, help us to distinguish between forms of, uh, of capital, of foreign investment and financing, which of course is you know, on this, it's a legitimate activity. All countries, and as we all know, uh, especially Latin America, um, want to develop economically. Uh, there's there's a great hunger and a great need. And you know, I, I admire that 
the, the leaders in the region who want to bring economic uh, development to their own populations. That is part of democracy is responding to your populations and making sure that their needs are met. However, when you start to drill down and look into some of the specifics of these agreements and more importantly, how they come into being, um, that's where you start to notice uh, some troubling signs uh, that um, sometimes there are, uh, you see political leaders around the region um, being willing to make uh, a number of concessions that really go against uh, laws and regulations on the books uh, in terms of procurement, in terms of environmental and social and labor standards uh, that you know the government are the government's responsibility to guarantee. Um, when we see uh, announcements uh, made and other political leaders in in a particular country are completely unaware that. Um, has happened, uh, for example, in, in the case of, of Panama and in Argentina, um, numerous, uh, well, in the case of Panama, um, of course, the, the government um, very abruptly switched its diplomatic recognition uh, from Taiwan to the People's Republic of China, um, and then thereafter announced a slew of economic agreements um, in El Salvador uh, as well, the government um, quite suddenly and unexpectedly announced, uh, the executive branch, of course, announced that it would um, uh, open, it would uh, devote a space to a um, essentially a tax-free zone and give um, the Chinese government uh, some very valuable property to build a port uh, that no one else in the government knew that this was happening. In Argentina, there was an agreement um, uh, under the uh, Kirchner administration to um, essentially give the, the Chinese military uh, land rent free for 100 years <laughs> for a satellite uh, uh, monitoring station. Um, you know, when these agreements happen in secret, you have to ask why? Why are these happening in secret? What, why does this need to be hidden from view? Um, and oftentimes that's because some of these uh, laws on the books are, are being ignored or perhaps the terms are really not all that favorable to the host government. Um, so that's, that's just one thing. Um, uh, corrosive capital functions by essentially trying to target uh, elites and um, something we call elite capture uh, where, it, you know, the goal is not necessarily to corrupt uh, the whole system, or again, to win people over to your side, but simply to um, make it in the interests of those who are in charge, um, make sure that they're benefiting in some way and you're benefiting <laughs> um, it, to reach these agreements. And often it's at the expense of the national government um, it can undermine the, the government's ability to collect taxes. Um, it can also, um, and the, one example, since you, you raised uh, Ecuador earlier, there was a paper published earlier this summer by the Carnegie Endowment that I would commend to everyone um, in the audience uh, that looked into two copper mining projects uh, that were undertaken um, in the country and uh, in, in Mirador, um, which ended up moving forward in, in San Carlos Pan Pananza. Um, in both cases, Chinese consortiums uh, ended up essentially deepening uh, societal cleavages by pitting uh, where you saw the national government interests as well as certain uh, locally, certain local leaders um, decided that they would do whatever it took to uh, attract uh, and keep the business of the these Chinese consortiums. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it was very detrimental to civil society and um, in particular in one of the cases, especially to indigenous community organizations who did not want these projects to go forward. Um, you know, part of this is because the Chinese government is not accustomed to working with civil society. They don't know how to do it because there is no, they've essentially crushed civil society within China. Um, and so when they, are trying to relate to foreign governments, um, you know, the voices of civil society are not really what matter to them. 
Um, and, you know, as, again, as long as they can find a way in with political or business elites, which, um, you know, is, is much easier to do when, again, there's no independent voices uh, or, you know, there, nobody is um, taking or very few people are taking a critical look at, at these projects. Um, you know, it, it's much easier to corrupt institutions and see um, how some of these regulations are, are essentially bypassed. Eric, can I can I jump in there? Uh, can I just build build off of what Jessica said? You can, but let me sharpen it up just a little bit, okay, please. Uh, and we'll come to you to to build on what Jessica just said. But the response that you would get from Beijing would be, well, a uh, you know they would disagree with that, but b how is that different, for example, from what they would claim Westerners have been doing in the region forever, uh, both in terms of corruption, in terms of anti environmentalism, all these things. I mean, that is a very potent strain of, uh, of return fire that you would hear from, from Beijing. And, and the question that I want to get at is, what is it that we believe is uniquely corrosive about capital from China that is different from, say, taking a tax deduction for corruption that the Europeans have done in the past and that sort of thing? I mean, there is corruption, but what is it specifically that we're trying to get at and we're trying to leave the audience with? David, to you, please. Well, it strikes me that at a minimum, the Chinese capital does not come with any strings attached imperfectly as those strings may be from uh, US or, or Western capital investment in the region, strings that would at least promote the institutions that are there by way of democracy, by way of anti-corruption. Granted, it's imperfect on the other side, but they have no barriers in terms of of a moral standard around that. And as Jessica said, and this was gonna be my point, on building civil society because they don't have it themselves. And so the idea that the capital investment has the best interest, imperfect as that may be from the US and from Western investors is still far better than one that is unconstrained in that area and serves the sole purpose for ultimately preventing any voice that arises against that Chinese investment. The other thing that I say, was gonna say is that the Chinese are very effectively getting into currency swaps with the whole objective of weakening the dollar. So that you have in Argentina and, and the Fernandes is there, uh, unconstrained from a standpoint of falling under the, 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 the guidelines of the IMF, for example, on any refinancing. And so the banks that I work with, which are Western, uh, are, are uh, really against the competition and where the dependency in these currency swaps to the Yuan uh, in Chinese currency is one that they're then, uh, the Chinese government turns into trade arrangements. And the dependency is starting to grow increasingly between Beijing and the Latin American capitals. And I'm, and I'm thinking of the large, uh, larger countries, but it's certainly not limited to that, to really undermining the US dollar and the multinational institutions that from Bretton Woods to present day have really been the governance structure around that. So there is a nefarious undercutting of those structures as well in terms of this sharp power. And let's not kid ourselves, it's happening before our very eyes. In a minute, we're going to uh, open up to some questions from those of you who are on the screen. And uh, if you could submit your questions directly to the uh, moderator here of the, um, uh, of, of the um, website, uh, then we'll be able to take those. John Zemko, I wonder if I could get you to, uh, to ask the questions as they come in. The reason why is because I'm having a little bit of difficulty seeing them, so it would be helpful. Uh, we could do it that way. Uh, but uh, let's go to you, Parsifal, uh, for your comments. Look, David has mentioned something that I think is a critical point uh, that has to be raised, the idea of leverage. And the West has been, or what we call the West, has traditionally used uh, capital, uh, particularly official lending and support, uh, as a way to promote democratic governance. Uh, and both Jessica, well, all three of you have mentioned that Chinese capital doesn't come with the same types of expectations. Recipients of that 
capital oftentimes find that to be very convenient because you know you get money and you don't really have to do anything except stay away from internal Chinese politics and what could be you know more you know that's very convenient for many people. But the question about leverage, you being in the you know on the ground in Colombia, right next door to Venezuela, a country that is in full scale collapse that in some ways has been enabled by the provision of Chinese capital, billions of dollars of, of uh, you know, purchases of Venezuelan crude. What are you seeing on the ground from this perspective? And is that something that we should uh, take greater know of, uh, greater understanding of the ability of, of rogue regimes to use Chinese capital to frankly uh, do whatever they want to their own people and uh, and and you know come what may for regional impact is that something that concerns you? Most definitely. Um, so when we're talking about corrosive capital, we it, it's impossible not to mention Venezuela. Uh, the China Venezuela case is the the archetype of corrosive capital in the region. Uh, j just to give you a little bit of context that. Uh, Almost half of all the, the financing that China provided to the region in, in the span of a decade, 2007, 2017, was to Venezuela. This is the most the country that has received the most financing from China, not in the region, this is worldwide. And this well coincided with the collapse of not only the Venezuelan economy, but its institutions. The what was left uh, at the end of the 2000s of, of Venezuela's democracy. Uh, uh, well, the, there's only vestiges of it now. It's uh, so. Uh, how did Chinese financing contribute to what was happening? So I think there's an important difference to make. So Chinese financing is not uh, uh, the root cause of what happened in Venezuela. So to blame the Chinese for the demise of Venezuelan institutions, it's it's not only it's not only wrong, it's false. That being said, it doesn't uh, it doesn't mean that it didn't contribute. So once what Venezuela was left out of, of the financial markets, uh, this was a very important cushion first for Chavez and then for Nicolas Maduro. So and 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 this is this has to do with the way China engages with countries not only in the region but worldwide. You have in countries where you have stronger institutions, you will see a more, let's say, traditional approach. You will have the top level approach at government, but you will also see interactions at a mid level, at local government level. You see a, a much more uh, um, engagement of the private sector. But in countries with weak institutions where the, the, the power is concentrated in, in, in elite circles, like the case of Venezuela, then you see an exacerbation of underlying problems uh, like, well, lack of institutionality, corruption, to the point that that's why I say Venezuelan case is so important that even the Chinese got burned uh, in Venezuela. They, no one, uh, and I say this with complete honesty, no one would have been, you know, happier that you know, all that money had actually gone to do the things that they say they were going to do, build the first high level, high speed um, uh, railway in Latin America, uh, all the food projects, all the infrastructure. And what are the results? More than 6 million Venezuelans have left the country. So, and that is precisely the reason why China has distanced itself from, from the Venezuelan regime, because they literally have nothing to show for. And it's basically a failed model that they implemented in Venezuela. Uh, and I think that is one of the main reasons why we have seen a deep decline in Chinese finance to the region, precisely because uh, they, well, they, uh, uh, they didn't know how to deal with uh, or they don't want to deal or just simply turn a blind eye to what was going on locally. And I think that's the most important uh, uh, like um, uh, lesson we can draw from, from the Venezuelan case. Do you see, Parsifal, let me stick with you for just a second. Do you see any uh, similarities to say a country like Colombia or others in Latin America with what's happening right now in terms of Australia? 
uh, with China using economic leverage to try to you know, leverage political results uh, in a country like that? Has that uh, been a model that you've been seeing where you are? Uh, not really, especially when we talk about Colombia. Col Colombia, in terms of its, its relation with China uh, compared to the rest of the region, is it's miles, uh, hundreds of miles behind. Uh, we are only seeing an, an in initial engagement in terms of infrastructure projects, government to government contacts. Uh, this is rather new in Colombia, uh, especially when we compare it uh, with countries like Venezuela, like Brazil, uh, like Argentina. Uh, and in terms of, of uh, using economic leverage around the region, there have been some instances. Uh, I, I would say the most uh, um, uh, the most important one of the one that caught my attention was uh, uh, during Macri's administration in Argentina when he tried to uh, renegotiate the, the 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 base down in, in the Patagonia and uh, Beijing pressured uh, 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 Buenos Aires with you know not economic sanctions but it was. Basically, we're we're going to stop buying X Y Z product if we if, if if you pressure us or if you push us out of the Patagonia. So this is the kind of things that I think are uh, the region hasn't quite gotten around to. Is it's creating a false equivalence in terms of these are both great powers when talking about the U.S. and China, and they're investing in the regions. So why should we, you know? Uh, uh, make a difference between, you know, where, where the money comes from. And, and in the end, as you very well mentioned, there's a lack of, of, of financing, of investment, of, you know, economic uh, uh, opportunities for the region. So why make the difference? And I think that uh, eventually the region will catch up to this because uh, it's one, if you can criticize the U.S. government for whatever policies have, it, it has towards a specific country, uh, but your government to government, your let's say government to private uh, um, exchanges with a US company won't be impacted in the minimum. Uh, and that is definitely not the case of China. And I think eventually we will see a little bit more, you know, leverage being, being uh, uh, used on the Chinese side when uh, they don't like a particular view at the UN, uh, positions vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, Hong Kong, internal issues in China, and the sorts. That's a really critical point. I'm glad you raised it. And, uh, you know, it goes to what David was saying and Jessica as well. I mean, you've got a very small group of decision makers in Beijing, at, you know, which are making the decisions uh, and, uh, you know, as state policy. Uh, and so you can have very much a, uh, you know, a leverage scenario that you're not going to have in dealing with the United States or Canada or the UK or Europe or Japan, uh, where you're dealing with private sector entities, and it's just a totally different thing. Um, so I think it's a really important point. I'd love to spend more time on it. Uh, we only have probably about 15 more minutes if we can sneak that much out, but I did promise to go to the uh, to those of you who've been watching uh, online, and we do want to bring you into this conversation. I have a number of more questions. I'll reserve uh, those for the next time we get together. Uh, but um, uh, John, uh, perhaps uh, if there are a couple of questions, uh, you would be willing to ask them on behalf of uh, those who have uh, sent them to you, if, if you have some, uh, and uh, direct them to the panelists uh, to whom they might uh, be best directed. Uh, and so I'll go over to you uh, for, for that portion of the program. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, I'm gonna, you know, in the interest of time, since we are you know, running short, I'm gonna combine you know, a few of the questions because we have a number of questions coming in from um, people asking how, number one, does this differ from uh, sort of Western you know, actions for, for, you know, contracting in the region. You touched on this a little bit before, but perhaps a little more in depth um, talk about, about how that might differ and how to some extent, perhaps the Chinese have even learned from, from Western governments uh, ability to do this over, over um, the past, you know, 50 to hundred years. But on the other side also, um, there's a question that points to how much can China sustain these sorts of endeavors um, given their, um, their debt, um, which this um, uh, audience member says is more than 250% over GDP. 
Um, to what extent can China continue to sink money into these sorts of ventures um, without sort of levels of transparency and accountability? So it's kind of a, a group question, I think. Um, I'm not sure who might want to tackle that first. Jessica, why don't you start, uh, and then we'll uh, go no, Go ahead, Jessica. Thanks. Um, I actually, um, sort of in responding to some of these questions, also want to circle back to um, the point that Eric and Parsifal were discussing about you know, what, what's happening in Australia, for example. Um, I think Latin America should be watching, and I think they already are watching, but, um, you know, Latin America's political or business elites, um, you know, need to see that you have to zoom out um, from what's happening in Latin America to understand how, how China's government operates and what's, again, what's motivating Beijing overseas. Um, and also to see, Again, what, what's different about um, the way that, that Beijing is, is able to direct its capital? Um, you know, we've seen time and again how Beijing does have a great exercise a great degree of influence over its so-called private sector. Um, you know, we shouldn't get ourselves, uh, you know, there, yes, there are state-owned companies. There are also companies with varying degrees of so-called independence. But I mean, you just look at what's happened in China recently um, in the tech sector, for example. Uh, you see, and with um, even cryptocurrency, you know, you see the Chinese government saying, you know, that this sector, in, in the case of crypto, um, that Bitcoin mining is something that the Chinese government doesn't want to allow because it thinks it's disruptive. So, you know, in a matter of weeks, it shut down the entire industry in the country and sent it, you know, entrepreneurs have gone overseas. Um, and the tech sector, uh, a number of, you know, which was previously seen as, uh, you know, perhaps too big to touch, very influential um, and powerful. You've seen a lot of um, executives and leaders of some of these tech, very well-known uh, and lucrative tech companies um, being brought to heel by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, they are held to account um, and that their activities whether it's with their activities within China and um, they can also be uh, incentivized um, or coerced uh, to essentially um, uh, use their, their economic influence to advance the Chinese Communist Party's interests overseas. You see that, um, of course, in Australia, uh, the Chinese government has been very, uh, <laughs> you know, direct in, um, uh, explaining how it will withhold its economic trade um, it, due to criticism uh, from the Australian government and Australian civil society. But you can look at any number of cases in Sweden, in the Czech Republic, um, in, in so many places around the world where um, you know governments or civil society have started a discussion and it, even in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, you see cases where um, the government, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, you know, the Chinese ambassador will tell a local government that you need to tell your media not to report on this, um, you know, bring them into line. Uh, they shouldn't be reporting on th this mining operation um, as has happened in Ghana, for example. Um, it, there, there are so many cases around the world and if you aren't zooming out and zooming in, you know, again, you're just seeing a little slice of the picture and you can't make, you know, these big picture deductions without looking at the whole and the aggregate um, to see how everything adds up. Um, and I, I think there really is uh, this question about how much can China continue to send its money overseas and sink it into foreign ventures. I mean, nobody really knows because information is just locked down about about China's um, economy, its government, and only the CCP probably really knows. Yeah, one of the countries I would also add to your list would be Canada, uh, which has also fallen, uh, had some, some real difficulties uh, recently with China. And these uh, are big, big players. These too. are big players, uh, absolutely, very much in the Western uh, orbit uh, and uh, very close to the United States and others. So, uh, yeah, no, I, th I think these are really important points. I like your idea of bringing, you know, looking, beyond the region to see what's happening elsewhere. 
uh, because uh, these are not necessarily unique to Latin America. These aren't strategies unique to Latin America. These are just simply uh, region. These are Chinese strategies that are being applied worldwide. Uh, David, uh, the question about, uh, I think it's a really interesting one. We could probably run a whole separate uh, meeting on this, but to get your points about, uh, you know, Chinese capital, uh, you know, is responsive to uh, global conditions indeed. And, uh, you know, there's some realities there in terms of China's own economy. And meanwhile, the United States continues to buy every product we possibly can uh, from China. So there's a lot of uh, hard currency that Chinese uh, that the Chinese uh, people have to try to place overseas uh, to get better returns, et cetera. How do you see uh, this particular aspect? Is this going to be something that will uh, increase or dry up or stay the same with Latin America? What would you anticipate looking forward? I know it's not a fair question because it's speculation, but what would you anticipate uh, the Chinese approach might be going forward on some of these issues to the region? Well, I, I think it's, um, it's informed speculation that yeah. Uh, the Chinese will certainly continue to expand their influence through uh, through financing, through trade, through commercial ties. Not all of it nefarious, by the way. Let, let, let's be clear. I mean, it buys raw materials or it buys agricultural products in order to feed 1.3 billion people. And, and those those ties. But But let's be real clear on the first question that John uh, I, I think kind of pulled together off of maybe several questions. The, the, the question on the table is which model are you going to support? And you have an authoritarian uh, uh, communist party driven uh, mandate through uh, Beijing expanding Belt and Road throughout the world. And I would call it Belt and Road 2.0. Uh, because they have adapted, they have adjusted, and Parsifal did, did a great job of describing how adaptive they are in, in going into these markets. I will also say then, do you go with the democracy model? And my great fear is that increasingly the model of authoritarianism is going to have a certain attraction because it's married to technology that will ultimately provide, at least in the short term, greater security. But it will come at the price or at the expense of, of suppression of civil society, and certainly not the expansion of civil society in terms of the Chinese objectives. So whether it's their investment, whether it's commerce, whether it's trade, China is here to stay, and I would argue here to expand in terms of its influence well beyond its near abroad, which we've often used in the Russian case, but in the case of China, well outside of the Asia Pacific area. And you see their interest, for example, in Chile, where I spent 10 years and I can see where those ties are getting stronger and stronger vis-a-vis -vis Asia Pacific, but China specifically. To our IT people, I hope we can isolate uh, the clip of what David just said, because that encapsulates, I think, a lot of what we were just trying to talk about in a very succinct and powerful way. David, thanks for that. Uh, we only have a very brief period of time. John, if there's uh, one final question that you might have or, or grouping together a group of questions, uh, uh, let's take that now. Um, we have another question that gets at the issue of, you know, what the reaction should be of, you know, of Western governments. In this particular, you know, particularly asking about the, you know, the U.S. government, but I think we could probably expand that to to mean European governments as well. You know, what should the reaction, you know, be in terms of what's the alternative offer, shall we say? Fabulous question. Let's have each of you uh, discuss that point briefly, uh, and also use that as a uh, an opportunity for any final thoughts. Let's take each one with two to three minutes. Parsifal, let's begin with you, and let's go in reverse order. Parsifal. Uh, David and Jessica. Okay, well, I'll try to summarize. Um, I'll just uh, like to give a, a really uh, a specific example. So um, despite the economic contraction of 2020, like China's outward foreign uh, direct investment in the region, it actually plummeted around 33, 35%. That being said, there was still a massive increase in employment generation. So uh, according to the um, our foreign direct investment uh, 
database of, of the CECHIMEX of Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. So uh, China's OFDI generated more than 173,000 jobs in the region, which is a more than 350% increase compared to 2019, despite the economic contraction. So th these are companies like Didi, uh, Huawei, Xiaomi. These are all companies that offer technological services, which have established offices in the region and they've become recognized friends uh, uh, that rival all their, their, their Western counterparts. So given the unpredictable effects of the pandemic on global labor dynamics, it's an increase in public and social perception given employment generation and the, the, uh, of Chinese investments around the region, this could well signal a major structural shift of investments into the service and technological sectors. And I think this is very important because 2020 was the last, was the first year in a decade where China didn't lend at least uh, at a, uh, um, a state-owned banks. It was the first year that they didn't extend any financing to the region. So if you want to talk about what is the counter offer, it has it has to be uh, directed at, you know, uh, uh, building stronger trade relations, open opportunities, financing for infrastructure. It is more or less the same package that China is offering, but through clean, transparent mechanisms that strengthen institutions instead of doing it behind doors like we have seen in, in, in the last uh, you know, 10 to 15 years. It's a great point. Look, the needs exist and Latin American and Caribbean audiences will seek to meet those needs however they can. If the United States shows up in a way to meet those needs from a democratic perspective, that's a more attractive opportunity. But if the United States and others don't show up you know, there's no decision to be made. You take the only offer that's on the table. Parcel, that's a great, uh, really powerful comments from you. Thank you for that. Uh, David, uh, to you, and then we'll wrap up with Jessica. Very briefly, we've spent a bit of our time pulling the zoom lens back. I'm going to actually zoom in, and I'm going to zoom in on technology. And I believe that in the 5G area and the role that technology has and where Chinese have their greatest interests by way of investment and control and the data producing that comes from that technology is precisely where the Western countries should be focusing their attention as competitors for that space. So whether it's Huawei, ZTE, or whomever it is on the Chinese side, because their intention is to gather as much information and I'll leave everyone with this line, the one who has the most information and can process it wins the war. Very uh, thought provoking. Thank you, David, for that. Um, Jessica, top that. <laughs> 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 <Over to you. laughs> well, you know, one one thing I want to pick up on that that Parsifal pointed out, you know, that uh, direct state to state lending has almost, you know, dried up in Latin America. Um, you know, I, I actually don't think that uh, that doesn't mean that China is not continuing to invest in the region or around the world. Um, a recent giant report, uh, an analysis released by Aid Data. Uh, at the University of William and Mary found that um, now, and this is of course at the global level, I don't know what the specific numbers would be um, in Latin America, but you can assume that this trend carries over. Uh, nearly 70% of China's uh, overseas lending is not directed at sovereign borrowers, but um, is now directed to state-owned companies, state-owned banks, special purpose vehicles, joint ventures, and private sector institutions. And so for the most part, these numbers are not showing up on government balance sheets as official uh, lending that's happening. So in many ways, these numbers are probably being undercounted and underestimated. Um, there are also cases where you see uh, Chinese um, consortiums uh, are, that are actually based in a third country are the ones uh, investing in Latin America. And again, that those numbers are not being reflected because uh, what you effectively see is another country shows up as the investor, not um, the actual Chinese uh, company or investment consortium. So that's that's one thing. But um, 
you know, I think to the question of what should the reaction be to all of this, um, you know, of course, I think for the world, the rest of the democratic world, especially the West, um, not just the West, though, other democracies um, like Japan, uh, for example, um, you know, they, they simply just need to continue to engage in the conversation. You know, it doesn't always have to be about China, but it just needs to be about, um, you know, values about what are our, we have shared values. Uh, democracies around the world care about, um, you know, what the, the social impact, the environmental impact, the economic impact is, you know, at the end of the day, um, about transparency and accountability. Um, values matter a lot and they should value to Latin America's political leaders. And then I think the reaction, you know, I would also turn it around. We need to talk about the agency of Latin America's political business leaders and populations. Um, you know, is there, I think they should ask themselves, is there really an open and honest conversation? Is there independent analysis? Do leaders feel that they have all the information they need going in? I, I don't think that they do. And I think they know they don't. Um, but how do you get there? And, you know, if you just allow the status quo to continue, um, it's not going to get them very far or get them any of the information that they need because China is investing so much of its resources in expanding its diplomatic presence, um, party to party exchanges, the state media outlet, um, the, the Chinese Communist Party's international liaison department, uh, you know, the United Front Work Department, there's a whole host of organizations associated with that. Um, all of these groups are rowing in the same direction as the Chinese Communist Party and helping to proactively shape the, dis the arena for discussion and the agenda. Um, yeah, so I'll stop Jessica, No, thank you very much. If, uh, if I could add my uh, two cents to summarize all of this, a dollar of investment from the United States has positive externalities. The dollar equivalent of investment from China may have negative externalities. So a dollar equivalent of investment is not the same. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen, as we bring our program to a close today. Uh, this obviously just opens the door to a much wider conversation, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, CIPE and the Council of Americas will be conducting through the uh, next uh, 12 months or so. Uh, but I really want to thank John, you and your terrific team for pulling this event together today. Magnificent speakers. You did a great job. I want to thank you personally for your engagement on the program today as well. Also want to thank our three terrific panelists, uh, Jessica Ludwig, uh, Parsifal DeSola, and David Shedd. You've done a great job. I uh, also want to thank Marvin Wiley from my staff here at the council. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we will conclude. Please join us again before long for the next installment of our Corrosive Capital series. Until then, thanks very much. Have a great day.